Hello, I'm Clovis Gasali in Paris. Welcome to Reporters. Our show today looks at a war that broke out on the edge of Europe. At the end of 2022, ex-Soviet republics battled over the Nagorno-Karabakh region, a disputed ethnic Armenian enclave. Thousands died in this conflict where Armenia fought Azerbaijan, supported by its close ally Turkey. It took barely six weeks for Azerbaijan's army to make significant territorial gains and only a Russian brokered ceasefire prevented the army from controlling the whole region. Our reporters John Walsh and Muhammad Fahat travelled to Nagorno-Karabakh where they met Armenians devastated and worried for their future. John, welcome to the show. Hello, thanks. Before we see your report, tell me about uh, the difficulties you encountered to actually get into that disputed area. But to be honest, at some point we even almost uh, give up. There was no problem with uh, the Armenian authorities, but the Russian forces who are now in charge uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh are preventing most journalists from entering uh, the enclave. In the end, we did manage to get in thanks to a well-connected uh, uh, contact, but we were told that no Western journalists were able to get in uh, since we were there a few weeks ago. Well, let's watch this report. It's called Armenian Despair in Nagorno-Karabakh. It's by John Walsh, Mohamed Ferrat with Olivia Salazar. Mengkort <laughs> Yerot Pashpana Kanis, Ganatsin Hadru Toknutsian, Hetoiras Diaknera, Dente Analyz of Gata. Images of the victims of the war are on display in Stepanakert's town center. Here in the capital of Nagorno Karabakh, no one has forgotten the sound of shelling nor the humiliating defeat at the hands of the Azerbaijanis. <laughs> Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh declared their independence in the early 1990s. At the time, they were citizens of Azerbaijan, a Turkish-speaking, predominantly Muslim country. The decision to break away gave rise to a war which ended in 1994. At the end of 2020, a new conflict began to simmer between the two former Soviet republics. In the space of six weeks, energy-rich Azerbaijan dealt Armenia a crushing blow. Turkey played an important role in that victory with its state-of-the-art drones and mercenaries brought from the battlefields of Syria. The war resulted in thousands of deaths on both sides. Under the terms of a ceasefire brokered by Moscow, the self-declared Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh lost a large chunk of its territory, in particular land they'd gained control of in the 1990s. The village of Taravat stretches over seven kilometers. Half of it is in enemy hands. That's the part we live in, us Armenians. The rest is under Turkish control. Those Turks are in fact Azerbaijani, but residents here don't see the difference. Many villages suffered the same fate as Taravat, cut in half by the war, with new borders imposed by the ceasefire. A hundred metres ahead, you'll see our positions, and then in 150 metres, there's a Turkish flag. 
two flags and two peoples divided by a stretch of land. Oleg takes us to meet one family whose house was on the front line. When the military operation began in this area, the people from the village organized our defense. They fought the enemy and we were bombed. Shells hit our house as soon as the fighting started. In the surrounding fields, the craters left by artillery fire are still visible. This building now needs weeks of repairs. A shell fell here. My bed was set alight after the roof fell in. Everything was destroyed. Serious damage to her home, yet Liana was more worried about just how close the enemy got to her. In Armenia's history, Taravart has never been taken over by the Turks. We never imagined that such a thing was possible, that the Turks could come here. Turks are here, there, there, everywhere. But we have to stay here, because we built a house here. A number of villages in the region did fall into Azerbaijani hands. We head to neighboring Martuni, where much of the town was decimated. Martuni and its region were hit particularly hard. The reconstruction projects are going slowly. There are major infrastructure problems, especially the provision of water and electricity. For now, the town still bears the scars of the bombing, like this crater in the middle of a football pitch. Haik Hanumian is a member of Nagorno-Karabakh's government. He was also involved in the war, heading up a brigade of 70 men. He's not convinced that peace here can last. In this region, we've always had wars. One breaks out every 25 to 30 years. I don't think it's possible to get back our land through peaceful means, that is, without resorting to war. It's an opinion many Armenians here share, having participated in that very conflict, including the emergency services who are on the front line. This building and an even taller one were destroyed in an air raid. The Turks attacked us from over there. That's where we blocked their advance. And the fighting stopped at these positions on November the 9th. November 9th, 2020, the date of the ceasefire. Before that, Varam and his friends occasionally took up arms to defend Martuni. Our main job was to evacuate those who'd been injured and bring back the bodies. But we also took part in the fighting when we could. During the war, many Armenian civilians and those from the diaspora volunteered their services, boosting the army's ranks, yet it did little to change the outcome. Varam's boss says the responsibility lies squarely with the Armenian government. The people weren't defeated. The army wasn't defeated. It was more like they arranged it so that we would be beaten. We have to start off by shedding light on what happened in Armenia, in our mother country. When you go to Erevan, you should ask Pachinian that question. It's become a popular refrain. The feeling among many of Nagorno-Karabakh's residents is that Nikol Pashinyan was a poor wartime leader and that he sold off their land. In Erevan, the opposition parties are all demanding that he step down. Pashinyan opted for a compromise, calling early legislative elections for June. Since Varam's house was entirely destroyed by the shelling, his whole family is now living in this apartment. His wife had given birth to their daughter just weeks before, meaning four generations experienced this war together. I was pregnant when the war started. We woke the children up very early and we went and hid in some caves. From there, we were taken to a village much further away for our own safety. We stayed there for three days 
We couldn't tell the difference between day and night. We couldn't sleep and the children couldn't either. We were all shaking with fear. Let's hope we get a bit of respite so we can bring up our children properly, so they might have a chance to succeed in life. That's all we want, peace. Nearby, Haik Hanumyan's inspecting the Amaras Monastery. Russian soldiers are protecting this building, which is located close to the dividing line. This military presence is essential, according to the minister, and to the local mayor, who was himself injured in the fighting. The Azerbaijani army is posted at the top of those hills overlooking us. During the war, they shelled Amaras a lot, but the bombs fell on the other side of the walls. The Russian peace mission is the best guarantee for our security. Outside, the Russian forces notice our cameras and make themselves scarce, but remain deployed all around the monastery. Moscow sent almost 2,000 soldiers to the region to ensure the ceasefire is respected. They'll be stationed there for five years. The Russians also control the Lachin Corridor, the only stretch of land that links Armenia to the enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh. On the road, you can't help but notice soldiers at the entrance to Chuchi, which is now known by its Turkish name, Chucha. This town, just 15 kilometers away from Stepanakert, was the most symbolic site of the recent conflict. With Azerbaijan's president paying it a carefully stage-managed visit when his troops seized the territory. Ilham Aliyev is keen to rewrite the history of Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh. During this visit to a 12th century church, for example, he disputed the authenticity of the inscriptions carved into the stone. Perched at 1,300 meters above sea level, the Gandazar monastery was spared from the fighting. This jewel of medieval architecture is an important place of pilgrimage. Artsakh was and will remain a Christian land and a Christian state. A number of temples, dozens, are now in Azerbaijani hands, but I hope that will be temporary. The cleric says that the conflict in this region has nothing to do with religion pointing the finger instead at the politicians. There were Syrian mercenaries who fought in this war, but I don't believe it was a religious conflict. Of course, we are surrounded by countries, and some of them are sadly our enemies. This family fled the region of Hadrut, which is now under Azerbaijani control. They say that if the Armenian political class remains bitterly divided, they fear for the worst. If things keep going in this direction, we might even lose Armenia altogether. It all depends on us. There are too many divisions in our little country. We have to fight these divisions by being united. One nation, one army, our fist held high. It's a slogan that echoes the words of the head of state himself, but it didn't change the course of history when it came to the reality of war. Nagorno-Karabakh rode high on a surge of national pride for 30 years after its secession. Now this tiny Armenian community is fighting for its survival without the recognition of any international allies. That was Armenian despair in Nagorno-Karabakh, and we've seen that this conflict has had a devastating impact on the whole of Armenia. And the Prime Minister himself of Armenia is fighting for his own political survival, isn't he, John? Yes, Nikol Pashinyan is really facing uh, mounting pressure. However, 
there are still some divisions among Armenians about their prime uh, minister. You have to remember that he came to power in 2018 with a massive popular support. At that time, he was promising a new era, especially uh, when it comes to the economy. Uh, listen to a brief sample of what we heard on the streets of Yerevan uh, when we were there. We feel the Prime Minister betrayed us when he capitulated. The Armenian people feel betrayed. Of course, he did good things, especially against corruption, in every sector. Everybody knew how the system worked, but no one took any action. So some divisions, uh, as you heard, but uh, Pashinyan had to make very strong uh, concessions uh, recently. He said that snap elections would take place in June. He also said that he would resign in the meantime, but this is quite theoretical because he wants to remain interim prime minister until then. Uh, we'll see how that goes with the, uh, with the opposition there. And this war has also been an opportunity uh, for Russia to get a new foothold in this strategic region. This, 30 years after the Soviet Union tumbled, you've got Russia, but you've also got Turkey, haven't you? Yes, we saw the crucial role played uh, by Turkey uh, in the conflict and we also know uh, that the, the Turkish president Recep Tayyip Erdogan has very strong ambitions in, in the region. Uh, and the, the official Turkish doctrine is actually very clear. Azerbaijan and Turkey are two countries but one single nation. And Erdogan wants to prove uh, his implication uh, uh, by going there to Nagorno-Karabakh in the coming weeks. He said he would be visiting some of the territories uh, conquered by Azerbaijan. And of course, there's Russia setting foot uh, in its former backyard. Uh, Russia is supposed to hand over uh, Nagorno-Karabakh to uh, Azerbaijan after the end of its five-year uh, mandate. Uh, and this could be uh, the end of Nagorno-Karabakh, but uh, there are right now officials concerned in Azerbaijan that Russia could decide uh, not to do so. So uh, it's a situation that we need to follow very closely in the coming years. Thank you very much, John Walsh. Your report and many others can be found on our website and on streaming platforms. That's it for this edition of Reporters. Stay tuned to France 24 for more international news.